We're going to give it a couple more minutes for a few people to trickle in. But thank you everyone who's here already. Looks like we've got a good number of people here. I know we actually had quite a few registrants as well. Uh, wasn't sure how that would play out with Zoom fatigue, uh, given that we're so far into this pandemic now and it's Zoom life for real. Uh, I will be your host this morning. You do have, I would say, a couple minutes right now if you haven't grabbed a coffee, tea, water, your beverage of choice, if you wanna go do that or take a bio break. We will start in four minutes. So go ahead and do your thing and we will get started shortly. Thank you for joining us today. On that note, do we wanna kick it off with where everyone is based? I did a pandemic move from LA to Las Vegas. So that's where I'm tuning in from today. What about you, Jake? Where are you based? I'm in uh, San Francisco. Ooh, excellent. What part of the city? Uh, the Mission District, right oh, off of lovely. Columbia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the best burritos in town. There you go, La Taqueria. <laughs> excellent. What about you, Garen? Where, Garen, where are you calling in from today? Yeah, I'm uh, just outside of Seattle, Washington, where we're uh, just on the tail end of a storm and staring down the barrel of a few more days of rain, but uh, we never let that keep us from enjoying what's otherwise a beautiful day. But that's the Northwest for you, right? It's usually a little damp and cool, but it's beautiful in its own way. <laughs> awesome. Peter, where are you calling in from? SoCal, if I recall. Actually, I'm in San Francisco, uh, just, a, just a hop, skip, and a jump away from Jake, uh, and a little bit more of a boring area of town um, around kind of the financial district, so a lot of office buildings around here compared to the mission, which I'm sure is, is a little bit more exciting. I mean, FIDA has a few hidden gems. If True. anyone is ever in San Francisco, if you like tiki bars, Peg True. and Idol is just at Bush and Kearney. There's like a whole light show and situation. Speaking of storms, it looks like a whole island tropical storm is going on in the whole bar every 30 minutes or so. So that's they always a good the, time. Um, they have the flaming drink as well that, that, that is served on fire, which is pretty fun if you haven't done that. Exactly. So don't diss Fidei. <laughs> it has a few True. hidden gems. <laughs> so awesome. Darren, where are you calling in from this morning? I'm calling in from Hermosa Beach, California, oh. 20 minutes from Los Angeles, if, if you don't know where it is, but uh, we we actually got rain for once yesterday. That is wild. <laughs> so, yeah, keep everybody's, Hermosa, uh, Hermosa. <laughs> yeah, everybody's huddled up in, in sweats and Ugg boots and everything else because it's a, a chill 65. Yeah, wow. <laughs> and for anyone who doesn't know, Hermosa is like the surfing capital, right, of California, at least. With all the yes. statues yeah. along and the and we usually strand. always have sunny weather, so we're kind of wimps when it comes to anything cold. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you have a hoodie on hand, so yeah. there's always that. And Ralph, unless you're somewhere else, I'm assuming you're in the Big Apple. Good afternoon, yeah, uh, over in New York. Uh, originally from England, so I was exchanging some uh, some banter with Gary in there about the, the rain. Uh, but yeah, I've been in New York for about two years, uh, originally from Manchester. Awesome. And we're like Commonwealth cousins for anyone who can't tell because I'm incognito, my accent has completely blended in. I'm actually originally from Canada. So I will be your friendly neighborhood Canadian host this morning. Um, it's about that time. So if you stepped away from your keyboard for a moment, you're gonna wanna take your seat because we're gonna get started. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know, my name is Ashley Scorpio. Uh, I am the Vice President of Partnerships at Hawk Media, your outsourced CMO. We're a full service digital marketing agency and consultancy with offices in LA, New York, Boston, and now remote employees in 40 US states and counting, as well as a team of 12 in Vancouver, BC. So that was our uh, first international expansion into my lovely homeland. So there you go, that's Hawk Media for you. We are going to continue with a round of introductions from everyone here today, and I will start um, let's go A to, instead of going A to Z, let's go Z to A. So we have partners here today from EcoCart, Clickly, Treat, and Zambula, as well as, of course, my colleague Ralph here at Hawk. So let's go the other way around and start with Zambula. Excellent. Good morning, Ashley, everybody. Uh, my name is Garen Hobbs, and uh, I am the Senior Vice President of Customer Success and Strategy at Zambula, 
uh, automated platform for solving the last mile challenges of dynamic content uh, personalization in emails and cross-channel messages. I've been in the space for over 22 years, held roles brand side, provider side, and done a few agency stints. Uh, so I use the intersection of all that experience to lend senior uh, direction and oversight to the customer success team, but more importantly, to work directly with our customers to put our capabilities in direct alignment with their uh, most desired uh, business outcomes. Awesome. Thank you, Garen. Uh, Jake, tell us about Treat and yourself. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Jake, the uh, co-founder and CEO of Treat. Uh, we help e-commerce brands be more sustainable and own the resale experience for the items they produce by creating branded resale experiences where their customers buy and sell from each other. So we manage the entire experience while brands are able to benefit by it through revenue, but also just being more sustainable, increasing customer loyalty and, and LTV. Uh, previously, I started a few of my own D2C companies and most recently was leading the sales and launch strategy team at Indiegogo before Treat. Very cool. Very interesting experience. I'm, I'm curious to see what your thoughts are in some of this space. And also, I'm sure you and Peter can share a lot on the sustainability front with our audience here today. Uh, uh, <laughs> Darren, let's kick it over to you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Darren Lemus, the Global Head of Accounts over at Clickly. Uh, for those of you that don't know who we are, what we do. Clickly is a 100% commission-based advertising platform. Uh, we leverage data-driven machine learning algorithms to drive sales across millions of sites. Um, again, all done on a performance basis. Uh, previous to Clickly, I did a lot of uh, integrated strategies at some large agencies for our Fortune 100 clients and actually owned and ran my own performance marketing agency for, I'd say, three years before Clickly. So uh, all of this stuff I'm super excited to, to speak to. Awesome. Thank you, Darren. And last but certainly not least, our friends at EagleCart, Peter. Hey everyone, thanks for taking the time. My name's Peter, I'm the COO of EcoCart and EcoCart has helped over 2000 brands create sustainable shopping experiences that help convert more shoppers and keep them coming back. Awesome, and an excellent solution at that. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us. We have quite the crowd here, more than I anticipated in our today's Zoom room, but we're happy to have you. Um, so today it's October 26th. So yeah, if you, in case you don't know, and I hope you do if you're in e-commerce, Black Friday and Cyber Monday are just around the corner at this point. So it's really time to focus on strategy for success uh, into Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and beyond into the holiday shopping and gifting season. Uh, there's a lot that can be said in particular this year with the state of the world and the pandemic, especially in the shipping, logistics, and sustainability sectors. So we'll definitely be touching on that today. Shipping in general has been a sore subject for the past couple of years. Uh, it's been worse than ever. Uh, this year, for anyone who isn't paying attention, there have been a lot of holdups down in SoCal. Uh, Darren, we might have to send you to Long Beach to see what's going on in the port there. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. I know uh, the CEO of Flexport got involved for anyone who doesn't, isn't in the Twitterverse. Um, you know, he rented a boat, did a tour uh, down there in the Bay of LA and realized how big the line is and how few sh shipping containers they were stacking. And one tweet got the mayor to even make a temporary change to allow them to stack the shipping containers up to four high instead of just two high. Um, and you might not think that makes much of a difference, but that very well may have saved Christmas. So he was the CEO that saved Christmas, not the Grinch that stole it. So very interesting stuff in the logistics space. Um, these, these, this year, I would say it's actually these years because I guess this started in 2020. Uh, but yeah, one in four e-commerce packages get returned. And on average, those return rates are expected to rise, especially for peak season. A lot of you have probably noticed a lot of brands have rolled out really generous return policies through past January, even into February at this point because of the situation. Um, and then if you don't know, uh, UPS, USPS has already slowed their service as well from a two to three day to a five day delivery window. Um, so if you are on the consumer side, definitely anticipate slower delivery speeds than you did in previous years. And it's definitely something customers are probably unhappy about. I can, you know, we're all primed for the Amazon Prime experience. So definitely something that's top of mind. Uh, beyond shipping and logistics troubles or headaches, I should say, I'd say sustainability issues are more top of mind than ever. 
customers understand the importance of these sustainable decisions that they're making in their own lives, how the products, services, everything that they're utilizing affect the environment and the world around them. And so a lot of conscientious, consum conscientious consumers are looking for sustainability initiatives from the brands that they support. Um, so definitely something you should be thinking about if you're not already. So yeah, let's get into the conversation on that note. I'm excited to hear from each and every one of you about how brands can prepare for the holiday shopping season and how you can also integrate sustainable initiatives to be part of that trajectory to success. So let's start with those shipping delay concerns. Um, you know, we saw the single most delays starting in last year since the history of e-commerce. Um, so I'd love to hear more of how you all think merchants should pre prepare and get ahead of shipping. Uh, Ralph, did you want to weigh in first? Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. I, I think I would best to to weigh in here just on, on the marketing side, right? How we communicate that and I'll let you know, some of the partners here talk more on the sustainable side of things. But one thing we've been, you know, just obviously having to communicate given, as you mentioned, Ashley, the news and, you know, it's no secret that it's gonna happen is how can we position that in the most pain-free way and so a lot of our strategists media buyers email experts here at hawk have been thinking about what sort of incentives and gifts and sort of make good type packages can we put uh instead of that delay right so thinking about you know what is going to make someone smile in a in a lose-lose scenario um so thinking about merchandise what works with your margins maybe pieces of content special treatment things of that nature to just sort of ease the blow of maybe not getting, you know, that prize uh, BFM CM uh, present on the day that you want it uh, is a big part of the communication strategy we've been looking at. And then also, you know, looking at uh, bundles and, and, and different sort of positioning, right? If you know certain inventory is going to take longer, thinking about furniture and things like that, you know, what can we get there? What wins can we highlight? Maybe it's, you know, a, uh, a coffee table, right? Maybe if it's a bar stool, just staying on the furniture trend. So thinking about, you know, how do we make good in a situation that is uh, gonna be bad uh, is a key part of what our brands and retailers have been working on the last few months. Thank you for that, Ralph. And since you touched on that communication strategy, Darren, did you wanna talk a little bit about how you guys see that over at Zambula? Yeah, that's, uh, a, that's a great opportunity. So I, I agree 100% with, with Ralph. I mean, the information's out there. So, you know, the three T's become very important and that's trust, you know, transparency and, um, and just telling, right? So the, the, the uh, different carriers themselves, USPS, as you mentioned, has already mentioned, they're gonna be slowing things down. Priority mail itself, five days around minimum, right? Both FedEx and, and uh, UPS have said they are now at 5 million packages more uh, then they can handle at peak capacity and they're both running below 80 percent of their people power resources so um, these are not secrets to everybody so i think brands and retailers um, have not only the responsibility but the opportunity to create more trust and transparency by communicating that forward one of the things we at zambula do are power uh, real-time banners uh, in emails and sort of can change out the messages programmatically depending upon data events or depending upon the individual. So calling these things out, right, um, in, is one way. Letting folks know there are just general shipping slowdowns. Real-time inventory and availability is another really great way to Ralph's point to surface immediately to your audience those things that are available. If they're not available online, perhaps they are available at a local retailer. So we can also plug into their um, logistics and inventory systems and see what might be available where for order online, buy in store pickup or curbside delivery versus going in store and buying it itself. So it's really about just surfacing the opportunity to the customer and understanding how that aligns with their needs, goals and preferences and simply presenting that as a proactive value experience. That makes sense to me. Uh, Peter, given the carbon neutral angle of EcoCart's offering, did you want to talk a little bit about this whole shipping situation? Yeah, absolutely. So although, you know, we're not helping our brand, you know, get any sort of products to their customers in a shorter amount of time or help, you know, alleviate the solution at all, what we have been, um, you know, working with our brands to do is help them um, you know, determine what the initial or what the additional emissions might be from, for example, you know, shipping their products um, via air versus ship, for example, um, which is going to create a significant amount more of, of carbon emissions and um, helping them, you know, offset those by funding 
um, you know, projects that help plant trees, build wind farms, et cetera, and, you know, communicate to their customers that, um, you know, in order to you know, get your package to you in the time that we promised, we had to you know, change our shipping method, which increased our carbon emissions. But don't worry, we've been able to you know, offset those by making a, a positive environmental impact elsewhere. So um, really consistent with the theme of, of communication and transparency here. Um, we've you know, been working with, with our brands to, to do this and, and definitely you know, a, a good reminder overall that, that decentralized you know, manufacturing, warehousing, shipping is um, you know, not only better for the environment, but also can help merchants overcome these you know, unpredictable issues like this. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense to me. Darren or Jake, did you have any thoughts on this topic before we move on? Yeah, actually, one thing that I wanted to mention from my days actually at Indiegogo, which, as you can imagine, the world of crowdfunding is not you know, no stranger to shipping delays. I think maybe 80% of campaigns ship after the deadline. And what we found just was the overwhelming uh, piece of feedback that we'd give brands in order to assuage uh, their, their backers was just like being open, transparent, and overly communicating which is something that uh, that Garen mentioned and, and Peter as well, just in like communicating to your customers and being very honest. Um, and what we found is just honesty over speed can alleviate anything, just as long as they know what's happening um, and are aware. And you can even plan those, um, you know, plan for the worst case scenario. You know, if, if, the, if the shipping delays are over five days or 10 days or whatever it is, having these, these communication, you know, copy or, um, strategies or even as Ralph was saying like what, what else can you give them that appeases them is it a piece of content and planning for that in advance and then communicating them with them when it does happen is so critical yeah I, I would agree there it's I think it's pretty clearly emphasized just be transparent set expectations and you're off to a great start uh, I think outside of the consumer side of things, from a brand's perspective, it's incredibly important to, in general, and I think we've all somewhat said it, just set a contingency plan. Um, you just wanna make sure that you have a proper plan in place if things go awry, if shipping company becomes too busy, if inventory doesn't arrive when it's supposed to, whatever goes on, a contingency plan in place is super crucial. Um, and it's all really about how quickly can you adapt uh, your your product plan uh, based on on what goes wrong, right? Yep, that makes sense. <laughs> Always have a plan B. I mean, I don't think many <laughs> yeah. people had a plan B pre twenty twenty for life, um, but these <laughs> days, you know, anything could happen. So failing to plan is is planning to fail. Um, yeah, so on that note, let's hopefully not fail the planet at large and let's get into uh, sustainability a little further. I think we can all agree that sustainability is extremely important uh, in general for the world, but also in today's e-commerce and brick and mortar ecosystem. The expectation is definitely there from consumers and research does show that um, the number of American businesses with formal green programs in place is up to 54%, um, according to a study actually conducted by Xerox. So there is still a 50% gap in sustainability. Uh, yes, it's good that the numbers are increasing, but we're not quite there yet. I would like to see it obviously a lot closer to 100%. Um, that means obviously there's still uh, a lot that can be done in this area. And I would love to hear from each of you what you think some of the best practices are for businesses around sustainability. Um, so yeah, I mean, let's see, Peter, would you like to weigh in here a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And I think part of the reason why there's still that gap is a lot of brands see sustainability as something, you know, of course, necessary in the long term, but in the short term, it's really scary and you don't know where to start and you often think of, oh, I'm going to have to, you know, completely revamp my, you know, supply chain, um, but I can't even you know, get packages to my, my customer's doorstep today. So how is that going to, you know, kind of play into my company as a whole? So, um, you know, what we at EcoCart try to do is, is make sustainability a lot, you know, easier, accessible, affordable for, you know, brands of, of all shapes and sizes. And, um, you know, we're definitely seeing it become increasingly important in the market, um, seeing some really kind of, there's a, there's a study recently that came out from, from Piper Sandler, I believe, that showed that um, the majority of younger generations, Gen Z and millennials, are actually 
considering their carbon footprint before making a purchase decision. I think that represents, you know, a pretty big shift in the market from a, from a consumer perspective. Whereas before, you know, that was sustainability was definitely, you know, nice to have cherry, cherry on top, but it's quickly becoming more and more of a, you know, expectation. And, um, you know, I think that it's important for, for brands to try to find more, you know, simple initiatives like, you know, what, what we present at EcoCard and other, you know, kind of simple tricks that they can do to their, their packaging, such as, you know, not including all the, the glitter and packing peanuts and things like that, um, just to really go from zero to one and just seeing what the response is from their consumers in order to, you know, really justify having more of a long-term investment in sustainability. So I think it's really important to, you know, give it a try, go to zero, go from zero to one with a simple initiative, communicate that to your customers, see the results and, you know, really go from there to get, make sustainability more, um, you know, core part of their brand. So I would say, you know, just dipping your toe in and seeing the response is, is really the, for the first great step. And in as something that seems very, you know, scary and, 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 you know, and, and difficult to achieve. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's a, it's tough to know where to start, but hopefully EcoCart makes it easy. Uh, Jake, would you like to frame this uh, part of the conversation from your end as well, and also touch on our question from the audience? Uh, Retro Radio Farm is a sustainable vintage radio electronics company, and would love to hear about leveraging treats in the antique vintage marketplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And first of all, I, I couldn't agree more with Peter uh, about sustainability being scary, especially when you think about changing your entire supply chain, changing the fabrics of your products and, and thinking in a, like in a circular way of actually producing the product and recycling it afterwards and creating stuff out of it. That can be really scary and that's like zero to 10. But fortunately, there's so many new solutions that get you from like zero to one or to two. And so like EcoCard being a great example, creating better size guides and you leveraging like sizing technology to reduce returns. There's a lot that you can do just in packaging and shipping and choosing the right shipping and logistics partner. Um, at Treat, we make it really easy for you to launch an entire resale experience in under a week so that you can keep items out of the landfill and extending the life of an item is the best way to keep, uh, to, to reduce its carbon emissions. And so just by buying a used item, you reduce its emissions by 82%. And so the way that we think about our why at Tree is actually really similar to Peter is like, what can we do to help e-commerce brands be more sustainable in a way that not only doesn't negatively impact their bottom line, but positively impacts it. And so like a simple thing to implement that can increase conversion, you know, uh, like actually benefit by like gaining revenue from the resale market and new customers. So all that stuff. Um, so that's how we're thinking about sustainability. Like what are these ways that you can become more sustainable. And I also don't think that uh, these initiatives make you a sustainable brand. It's all about just becoming more sustainable. And so even the most sustainable brands will tell you that like these initiatives, it's like an ever evolving journey to become more sustainable, more circular, you know, progress over perfection. And so all of these things that you can do for little wins. Um, and then, so yeah, Retro Radio Farm. Uh, I love that name, by the way. I can't wait to, to, to look it up afterwards and, and see what they're all about. Um, we, uh, we're, we're just now, um, I guess, Antique, antique Vintage Marketplace. Um, you know, we're, we're just now talking to brands outside of e-commerce and, uh, or sorry, brands outside of apparel and apparel accessories. And so we're talking to electronics companies and furniture companies and, and things where a peer-to-peer -peer resale platform um, can also become really interesting and compelling. And, you know, we see uh, basically Treat being able to be leveraged for any brand that you'd see having a resale market on eBay, Craigslist, or Poshmark. And so, uh, K, uh, is it Kia? Um, I, I'd encourage you to reach out to me and we can actually talk in depth about this if you want to explore what that would look like. Uh, my name is, or email is just jake at treat.co. Um, and we can talk about what that means for your vintage marketplace. Um, we, we launched with, with Goodfair, which, which does like vintage clothing. And uh, we're talking to a few other vintage folks that, uh, that don't have brand new items that are selling used items to begin with. And, uh, and then those items go on to be resold again and again. And so um, it's, uh, it can be a great way just to like continue the lifetime value of that same customer selling on your, on your site. I love that. I also love the whole concept of 
um, upcycling, recycling, and also what's interesting to see is the repurposing of certain items as well. Not to mention, uh, you know, with the fast fashion that we've seen in the last decade plus, oftentimes the quality of those vintage items, even from decades ago, are actually much higher quality and much better positioned to be repurposed and reused and passed down and around, if you will. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting to see that, especially when it comes to, let's say, de denim, like vintage denim is a big one, uh, considering how much water it takes to produce just one pair of jeans. That's a really big one for sustainability. Uh, Darren, I think you had some thoughts uh, on this topic as well and around margins. So would you like to speak to that? Yeah, definitely. I think brands are, you know, not, in, well, yeah, somewhat intimidated sometimes, right? Because it's a little bit more of an investment when you're going towards sustainability um, and a little less margin. And sometimes they view it as, as a bit harder, right? And so um, for us, we've worked with a lot of, of businesses and brands that have slowly transitioned to, into that. Um, and one of the things where at least one of the strategies that they use, especially going into Black Friday, Cyber Monday, is they're really making those inventory decisions earlier on what products they're going to promote and how can they start to adapt in certain ways with sustainability. Um, but even further within that in our platform, the margin aspect of that, we give brands full control. So we're performance based. We don't require upfront spend. Um, brands select what products they'd like to advertise and more importantly, helping with that sustainability aspect is brands get to select what commission they're paying out as well. And so really leveraging that aspect of control within our platform allows them to, you know, in certain aspects, not have to heavily pay up front, which is typically somewhat risky, right? Especially when there's more competition, it's more expensive, um, but even more so understand, okay, cool. I, I know that I have a locked um, payout in that's a performance based on a sale. So I also know very predictably what margins I can use, what I have to, to kind of invest elsewhere that's gonna help my company in other ways. Awesome, makes sense to me. Garen, did you have thoughts you wanted to share? I did actually, uh, I agree with both Peter and Jake. It's always scary to start a new initiative, especially when you have to structure one that uh, you know, is required to be mutually beneficial to both the growth and bottom line of the company as well as the customer at the same time. Um, you know, Darren just gave us some great ideas uh, and some great thoughts on how companies can uh, make the uh, sustainability initiatives a little bit more profitable. But you know, regardless of how you approach this or at what stage you are in your efforts, it's really important to understand how this is resonating with your audience, right? Um, there's a lot that goes into sustainability and the benefits are you know, uh, almost innumerable. And not everything's going to resonate with every with every single individual. So a great thing to do is to understand exactly which of those values aligns with the, each of the individuals within your audience. And there's some great things that you know Zambula can do with regards to polling and profiling, so you can use that to then contextualize the value language against offers and products. You know, purchasing this product will help us do X uh, towards the environment or towards becoming more sustainable. Um, and then you're fostering advocacy through that reinforcement of uh, and, and, and uh, increasement of visibility, right? So again, you're creating more of the experience and you're growing beyond the transactional nature of the typical brand consumer relationship. Um, but initiatives like this are great. You know, they're very, uh, there are a number of uh, sort of different market segments that are extremely passionate about this. You know, Gen Z and millennials for sure are the most passionate and they speak very much with their wallets, but we're seeing this trend grow among older generations uh, or other generations, we should say, um, as well. And um, everyone has one thing in common, and that's just this desire to participate, um, not just through consumership, um, but to become a little bit more, you know, um, active in their participation. So some of the things that uh, we've helped put in place for a number of our customers are, um, for example, the ability to donate loyalty points to, sustain, uh, to uh, sustainability initiatives or at checkout, giving people the option to pay more for sustainable practices um, for, you know, for example, more um, biodegradable packaging and things of that nature, or even the opposite. And we've seen Amazon do this where they reward you with things like credits or digital products by um, waiting maybe an extra day or so for a couple of your items and allowing them to bundle them into fewer shipments. So I think that uh, understanding the context of value and then again, giving folks the opportunity to participate in different ways is a great way to not only push sustainability initiatives forward and keep them growing, um, but also in some cases to um, allow the customer to help make those things profitable. Awesome. That sounds great. Makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Ralph, did you have thoughts on this topic of sustainability that you'd like to share? 
Yeah, I think Garen was was really leading on to what I was going to try and talk about here. I always think, you know, it's all great for the sustainable aspect to a, a customer, but like, let's continue to tell that story, right? Consistently, cohesively across all channels. I mean, whenever I make the decision to be more sustainable or to do something good for humanity or the planet or whatever it is, I get a really good feeling when I can see that change. And what I mean by that is like seeing, you know, uh, <clears throat> extrapolated data, right? Maybe in an infographic on social media, maybe a, like a blog content, you know, a piece around how we're making inroads towards uh, some sort of initiative of the business and how I'm contributing towards it as a customer it really sort of builds that trust, makes them feel good, builds that connection even stronger. And then, you know, finally sort of continuing it post-sale through channels such as email or SMS or anything like that, just to reinforce, you know, that, that, that sort of feeling that we're all doing something great. Um, and a good example I would give of a business like this is Blueland, right? Everyone knows Blueland. It was on Shark Tank. All the emails that I ever get from them always continue on with that, you know, the amount of bottles saved, the amount of, you know, tonnage or trash or whatever, you know, all things like that um, just really needs to be kept on the forefront because it's all well and good, you know, picking up that conversation occasionally, but it can be forgotten between purchases. Um, and that way, you know, the relationship can be lost. So that's what I would touch on. Uh, from what's been said there, Ashley. Yeah, makes sense. It makes a lot of sense to me. I think it's important to highlight those initiatives along the way. That's a big part of storytelling, which of course leads mm -hmm. into building your brand. Um, yeah, and so on that note, I think we've covered sustainability enough to at least frame up the rest of the conversation. A big other part of uh, holiday preparedness is actually positioning yourself for success and planning ahead of time. Many businesses, of course, see a massive spike in orders around Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and into the holiday shopping season. Um, obviously, businesses need to be prepared, especially given even those delays we've already talked about in the ports, in the shipping, with USPS, et cetera. So, um, you know, we need to think about what timelines and deadlines look for in that sense of how businesses can prepare for that holiday season. What dates should brands be keeping in mind from marketing timelines and launch dates for campaigns, for shipping, et cetera. Uh, Ralph, would you like to kick it off on this topic as well? And then uh, we can get into it with everyone else. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've been with Hawkby here for about four years and each season is, is crazier than the last. And um, it is, you know, buckle in uh, for everyone, but if done right, it can be just an extraordinary time of year for all clients and experts here. So I think what I would like to do actually is maybe just talk, you know, in an ideal world, but also, you know, make sure the attendees and people who get to watch this can act upon the time we have now, right? Because we are a month away from Black Friday, Cyber Monday. It's not overly helpful if I tell them, you know, we need to be doing all this and it's three or four weeks ago. But I think, you know, the way Hawk Media, we look at it is, you know, we look at it from a strategic perspective first, always try and, you know, boil it down to what we can be doing before, you know, we push go on any sort of spend or campaign or channel just to make sure that we're, you know, we're running in the right direction. So obviously, you know, the, the marketplace has changed. There's been a lot of curveballs thrown uh, in 2021. Uh, everyone knows that, but I think looking back, you know, at the platforms, the partners, the ad accounts that you have and seeing, you know, where is our audience going, right? What are their demos looking like? What channels are they playing on more? And what, you know, what worked well last year, right? And then trying to build into 2022, okay, if we are going to be, you know, spending more on say a, a TikTok or a Pinterest or a Snapchat, you know, what is that creative going to look like? You know, what are those messages going to look like? What are the sort of bundles and the margins um, and the strategies that we're going to be incorporating here, knowing, as we said at the start of this uh, webinar here, we are going to be experiencing ship delays. We are going to want to be building in sustainability and really touching on that. So that's a big, big component of it, sort of at that that sea level suite. If I was to dive maybe into more channel specifics, I think you know website is a given. It's got to be fast. It's got to be responsive. It's got to resonate with the time of year that we're in. So thinking, you know, seasonal photography, um, seasonal festive sort of call to actions messaging, trying to you know, get people in that vibe early on that, you know, we are going to be having some transactions here towards the end of the year. I think, you know, when you look at 
the paid media aspect of it, right? You really have to be building your audience in the September, October time period, right? It is very competitive as we run into October for a smaller brand, you know, looking at what keywords can we cut out, you know, potentially limiting on Black Friday, Cyber Monday type sales. If you don't have that budget, as you don't want to go toe to toe with some of the bigger box retailers and behemoths out there. Um, and then sort of weaving into uh, influencers affiliate, right? Everyone is, is big on, you know, utilizing social proof, getting buy-in from, you know, like-minded publications and publishers. Really, those would have been in the work, actually, in an ideal world in early October, September time, right? But those people are going to be inundated with, you know, all sorts of pitches and presentations and promotions. And, you know, we don't want to get lost in the shuffle. So a lot of conversations we've been having here at Hawk has been, you know, how do we get ahead of that and set you guys up so that as those assets and posts and placements and articles and blogs and features and things like that are set up, you know, our web and our email and our, and our ads are really, really set up to, to nurture and convert them. And then finally, just as we're talking about um, communication, I think, you know, email, SMS, chatbot is, is going to be a huge component this year, right? What we typically look at at Hawk is building that list, right? 60, 90 days out, right? Really, you know, A-B testing pop-ups, A-B testing giveaways, A-B testing contests, you know, trying to communicate to our VIPs or, or you know, um, biggest advocate consumers that, you know, there is going to be a, a hassle. There is going to be a rush this time of year. We're going to offer you, you know, a better discount or a better deal if you were to, you know, get on board early and we can give that, that, uh, that offer to you. So that really excites people. And then the final piece I'd touch on there is, is the support system. Um, you know, people know it's going to be a, a shuffle. People know there is going to be some uh, nail biting of if the FedEx or the UPS driver turns up. And so having that support there of like, you know, your order's on its way, you know, we're here if you need you, those sorts of things um, really, really going to help when a consumer is weighing up your brand compared to another and you have, you know, the support system there and the platforms and the tools to help compared to someone else. So a little bit of a ramble there. Uh, it's hard to sort of uh, condense everything that we see at Hawk into uh, uh, an answer, but hopefully that gave everyone some, some good insight there. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, Darren, did you want to build off of that? Yeah, no, a, a ton of good stuff there from, from Ralph. Um, you know, I mean, I think in an ideal world, the most simple answer is start as early as you can. <laughs> um, and I, I think year over year, especially with the pandemic, consumer behavior shifting more towards digital. And now some things are open. Are they going to go back? Is it a hybrid, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I think that Black Friday, Cyber Monday now and every year will start earlier and go longer. You know, so how much endurance do you have, really? Um, some, some advice that I have, and we're a bit different. Uh, Clickly, we view ourselves more as an accelerant, a little bit of fuel on the fire, if you will. Um, we preach channel diversification. Uh, I think it's it's great. Obviously, omni-channel, you want to be everywhere that you can uh, from, from the consumer standpoint. Um, but specific to Black Friday, Cyber Monday, I think there's opportunities for brands to really look at the whole 80-20 rule or however you want to state it. Uh, basically, you know, 20, 80% of your, excuse me, 20% of your audience is, is driving 80% of your, of your revenue and really understanding within your audience, what sales channels they're in so that you could properly communicate and identify those sales channels and then double down. Um, obviously going into those sales channels and doubling down, um, kind of allows restrictions on channel diversification. Um, and, and the reason we call ourselves an accelerant is based on our business model. No upfront spend, add clickly, we hit millions of websites, you select your product, you select your commission. So in turn, it still allows for brand awareness being in other channels while allowing you to shift that, uh, you know, what I'll call investment to your main channels that, that your consumers will be in. Um, I think that's incredibly important. I think clickly also in a, in a sense of kind of speaking from a bias is really, really strong in continuing to retarget past visitors and customers from a retention standpoint. Um, by all means, you know, most brands are looking for new customer acquisition, but um, there's so much more to be squeezed out of your, your current customers and understanding their wants and needs, where the channels are, what channels they're in. Um, and I actually loved what, what Ralph mentioned, which is 
you know, start hitting those people early. Hey, we're, we're going to be super busy. It's going to be crazy. You guys are our best customers, our most loyal. We want to make sure that you get what you need in your hands. Um, so communicating that early will allow you to, again, focus on the consumers that are driving the most revenue, in turn, shift that revenue into where those consumers are and adding Clickly or any other performance marketing channel, to be honest, uh, to continue brand awareness is, is something that I definitely put, put forth for brands. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think everyone has been paying a lot of attention, attention to all the iOS changes this year and how that's affecting CAC, the cost for acquisition across all those different paid channels and performance channels. And hence why perhaps, you know, your owned and earned channels, your existing uh, audience, your most loyal customers might be a better place to start this year, especially as things become so competitive and we continue to see costs rise, which is in particularly uh, important if you are a smaller or mid-sized business and you're looking to stretch those marketing dollars and those budgets. So definitely something to think about. Um, I also think a lot of it is what we're seeing on the trend side of things this year is why we're seeing more and more like early Black Friday deals. You know, a lot of deals are launching as early as last week. Some are starting November 1st. I think, again, that's to get ahead of those shipping delays that we discussed at the start of this conversation um, and also to get those products into the hands of uh, perhaps their most loyal customers. That's also something I've noticed is that they're giving some of those segments, audience segments, a heads up and a head start mm -hmm. to also shop the sale or get the deal first. Um, to thank them for their loyalty and support. So I think that's also a really interesting trend we're seeing this year. But uh, before we fully dive into trends and what we're all seeing this year, Garen, did you want to talk about the deadline timelines um, that we were talking about, generally speaking, and how you all see that at Zambula? Yeah, great question. And I agree with uh, my, my fellow panelists here. I mean, those dates can be pretty flexible depending upon your business model, depending upon your campaign schedule and depending upon what's really going on in the real world. But, um, you know, not to be boring, but I tend to echo everyone here. It's about getting started as early as possible. It's also about, you know, sort of the intent with which you create the assets for other campaigns outside of holidays. It's a it can be a pretty junky prospect to create, to put a lot of effort and resources into something that gets used only once or twice. So one of the things that we work with uh, with our own customers here is when developing or strategizing the development of campaigns is to think about how they might be used in evergreen ways. In the case of holidays, sometimes it's a very, very simple creative facelift um, that would now take uh, a regular sort of, uh, you know, recurring campaign and make it feel something very bespoke and specific for the holidays. Um, getting started early is, is, is a great idea, not just with regards to marketing planning, but with conditioning the audience to buy early as well. Amazon's gotten a great head start on this, not to trot their name out there again, but you know, this is one of the reasons they've moved Prime Day ahead earlier is to um, decrease the, their competition for, you know, for some what has become sort of a scarce gifting or um, call it a residual income dollar. Right, so and that's another reason that that uh, would be great uh, of great advantage for a lot of brands to sort of condition their audiences to buy a little bit earlier than Black F uh, Friday and Cyber Monday. Certainly, the audience value um, is to make sure you get exactly what you want while we still still have it. Get a jump on everybody. Give everyone the holiday that they want. Uh, but the other side of that again is is uh, very much uh, business logic, and that's you know creating uh, an opportunity for less competition down the road by capturing more of that that dollar uh, now a little bit earlier. Um, the other side of that actually coincides with um, some of the things that Darren was saying earlier about, uh, you know, maybe even shopping on margin and sort of prioritizing some of those uh, products as well. And you, uh, marketers can do that uh, after Cyber Week as well, looking at things like remnant inventory or high, remain, high margin remaining items and then prioritizing that uh, with uh, deep discounts or at least uh, what seem like competitive discounts and grab what's left of the holiday dollar up. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense to me. Let's switch gears a little here and talk more about those trends that we're seeing from a business perspective this year and how things have shifted even from last year into this year. You know, Ralph, I know you mentioned how things have continued to evolve year over year for the past four plus years. Um, so yeah, I think we should all get into you know how brands and businesses can position themselves in terms of marketing, be front and center for the holiday se season. Um, you know, according to Adweek, nearly half of shoppers that they surveyed actually started their holiday shopping before and often in place of store doorbusters on Black Friday. So 
last year was actually kind of a record breaking year. We actually saw, especially because people were in lockdown for the first time, a lot of consumers actually started researching and doing homework for holiday gifting in April of 2020 last year. Obviously things opened up a little bit. So presumably people were getting back out into the world and didn't start that early, but you would be surprised, which is also where oftentimes reviews, testimonials, UGC, those are the sorts of things that consumers are often looking for in e-commerce when they're trying to make up their minds and, and make their decision about what to actually buy for themselves and to gift. Um, so yeah, it's definitely an extremely dramatic a uh, shift we've seen in consumer behavior and also the increase in e-commerce sales, I think is up over 47% year over year. Um, what's also super interesting to note is despite the fact that everyone has been uh, at home a lot more than pre perhaps previously outside of a pandemic, a lot of those transactions actually still happen on mobile devices, even though people were in their homes. So uh, Adobe did find that over half of digital Christmas revenue in 2020 actually came from transactions conducted on smartphones. So yes, I would, on that note, would love to hear from each of you what you think some of the biggest trends are for this season. Uh, Peter, how about we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. So something that we're, you know, actually seeing beyond the, you know, early shopping and other things that, that, that folks have mentioned is um, really just individual shoppers becoming more and more, um, I guess the word is, 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 is numb or overwhelmed with your kind of traditional, um, you know, sales, your traditional, you know, 10% off sales. I've been, you know, seeing a lot of this, um, a lot of feedback from our brands as well as just, um, you know, on Twitter, people like posting the screenshots of their inboxes, like I have 110 20% off sale emails there. So something interesting that we've been doing with with our brands that we've seen some really kind of initial um, uh, results from is helping them run various like sustainability focused sales that are targeted towards their uh, eco conscious shoppers, which EcoCart helps them identify kind of who those are and segments those. So running things like, you know, your, your net will be able to, you know, offset the carbon emissions of your next order for free, or we'll plant 10 trees with your next order, or, you know, just various, uh, what we're calling the kind of sustainability sales in place of the typical, you know, 10, 20% off, which not only are we seeing, um, you know, greater, you know, KPI, marketing KPIs around these, um, for these, you know, eco-conscious segments, but it's also, you know, less costly than your, you know, traditional sale. I know that, you know, important part of what, what Ralph mentioned was, um, you know, being able to keep up, keep, keep your margins up with these, you know, larger sales and, you know, competing with the big box brands, which will, which is very tough from a pricing perspective, but what you can be doing is from, you know, a branding loyalty perspective, which um, is really where these, you know, sustainability sales, um, you know, start to come in is, you know, not only are you not eating into your margins, but it's also, you know, a brand building activity. So even if that shopper, um, you know, doesn't choose to, you know, pursue that sale or purchase right there at that moment, you've still had a, you know, a value added brand building touch point. So um, really kind of overall what we're seeing in the market, um, at least from, from, from our brands is um, having a tough time with the traditional sales. So, you know, we're helping them do some of these other, you know, creative brand building sales really, you know, around sustainability that we've, you know, helped them identify various targeting segments for. So kind of an interesting new strategy that we're, we're seeing in the market right now. And I think that's only going to become more prevalent, you know, this year and, and next year with the holiday seasons. Awesome. Makes a lot of sense to me. Jake, would you like to touch on this as well and what trends you're seeing? Sure. Yeah. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't also bring in a sort of like a sustainability slant or some conscious consumerism angle, um, kind of on top of Peter's just to, to kind of really hit, hit that point home. And th there was a, a recent uh, paper that came out from Cohen Equity Research, which showed that about 80% of m millennials and Gen Z prefer to shop from sustainable brands or brands that have some sort of social impact. And so with so much online shopping happening this uh, this year, it's an amazing opportunity to showcase what that's all about. And um, uh, starting, I think, a few decades ago, uh, brands have started to do what's called a like Green Friday uh, instead of Black Friday. So actually using this opportunity to 
um, either like, uh, you know, Patagonia had their really famous, uh, like don't buy this shirt campaign. Um, other brands have donated the profit from Black Friday um, if uh, to social causes or environmental causes, which if you think about it is a really nice long-term strategy. It's not looking at this short-term weekend where you have like this giant influx of sales. Um, it's, it's looking at the long-term of, uh, yes, getting the most customers to come in and interact with your brand as possible to create that amazing brand touch point, convert those customers, and then keep them in the brand and in the fold while doing social good or environmental good. And so there's a lot that brands are doing um, to be like this Green Friday. And this just goes back to another theme that Peter was talking about, which is like just standing out. Like what There's so many sales and so much, your inbox is just inundated with so many like 80% off for some fashion brands, which is just absolutely ridiculous, or brands that are starting last week doing their Black Friday sales, which is crazy, you know, when you really think about it. Um, and so what are those really interesting, unique touch points that you can have that stand out from the pack? And, um, you know, also offering a e-commerce solution. So at checkout, you know that you can have a path to resell the item. Like, what are those quick and easy things that you can add on to? And um, we were just talking to, uh, to Tropic Feel, uh, the sneaker company who has, uh, who last year sold like overstock inventory or sample sale inventory production units and, uh, and really showcased all of the stuff that they couldn't sell or haven't been able to sell on their main site, you know, return inventory, all of this like not new stuff and using their Black Friday deal as a way to make sure that that inventory doesn't make it out of, doesn't make it to like the landfills and it actually stays in circulation. So those are some really, you know, just high level and also some specific examples of ways that brands are standing out by being sustainable and by being green. Definitely. I also think another great example um, is REI, of course, with the opt outside tradition. So for anyone who doesn't know, REI typically opts out of Black Friday. They usually close on Black Friday. They don't offer sales and instead they encourage their customers um, and employees to opt outside instead, which is definitely very much on brand for them as an outdoor lifestyle uh, brand. So definitely it's another way that you can think about storytelling and that long-term relationship with your customers for sure. Um, Garen, would you like to weigh in here? I'll go to yeah. you next. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and you mentioned REI, I mean, quick uh, brag boast. I actually had got the opportunity to work on that camp, that first campaign seven years ago and opting out of that was a huge success for them um, not only in terms of um, sort of you know uh, social perspective but in terms of revenue as well obviously the rest of the week that followed uh, just brought a huge influx of uh, very loyal and dedicated REI fans but I want to touch again on something that Peter had mentioned and this is the numbness um, that a lot of consumers are feeling and they're feeling that in two ways one as you mentioned just opening up your inbox there's an absolute flood of emails in there. We see a exponential uptick in the amount of email volume sent over that 30-day uh, period from the end of October to, uh, well, I guess that'd be a six-week period from the end of October to the middle of December. Um, so uh, I agree, standing out in that inbox, uh, regardless of the channel, you know, becomes increasingly important. But they're also numb um, to the discounting itself, this promotion exhaustion. It's also, speaking about sustainability, an unsustainable um, you know, sort of a way to appeal to the audience themselves. You're also conditioning the audience to only buy during times of deep discounting, right? To Peter's point, if it took him 10% to get him across the line this time, what's it going to take next time? To, you know, 15, 20, it's a zero sum game. So I talked a little bit earlier about when we were talking about uh, sort of uh, sustainable values. The same works when uh, you talk about brand values, understanding the context of your brand or the product itself to the each individual helps you build a greater value of relevance by contextualizing that, right? The, not just buy these shoes, but the, uh, these are the shoes to get you furthest down the trail, the trail. And we know that you love to trail run every day. So putting the product or the offer in the context of the way it, which will be used or to help better represent the value uh, that it actually means to the customer themselves. Um, this will help kind of cut down that noise to signal ratio in the inbox, as well as make discounting seem uh, more special, more profound, um, uh, uh, again, especially when compared against folks who may be reaching a little bit deeper in their pockets to, to slash prices. Um, it's not just important that we do this in, you know, email, but, uh, you know, I heard other folks mention sort of cross-channel as well. Again, this is an engagement ecosystem, so making sure that same level of contextual or meaningful and value-based experience sort of follows the customer as they meander from channel to channel through sort of different levels uh, of the funnel itself. 
Um, the last thing I would say is, you know, make it about uh, the season as well. So uh, understand what people are buying and what, who they're buying it for. Oftentimes these aren't uh, themselves, it's for gifting and it's a terrifying proposition, <laughs> buying something for someone when you're not exactly sure if it's going to be the right fit or not. So um, there's a lot of things that we're doing to help uh, uh, sort of consumers understand or at least surface to them recommendations that are likely relevant um, to the reason and people that they're buying for. Yeah, absolutely. Darren, would you like to build off here on what holiday trends you're seeing? I mean, a ton of great stuff. Um, I, I would agree and, and I'd almost kind of take it all in and, and offer advice as well. I think there's a difference for each brand, right? Every brand is different in terms of their goals. Uh, there's a short term, there's a long term. I loved what Jake mentioned in terms of the long term aspect of really looking at Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Um, just to take it very high level, Black Friday, Cyber Monday is a, is a huge opportunity for a new brand. It's, it's where they're going to see the most traffic, the most visitors, um, possibly be able to get the most feedback there is. Um, and if you as a brand have that ability to maybe break even, I mean, every brand wants to spend that revenue, but really look at this as a long-term strategy um, in furthering not only your personalization, which is super, super important as we continue forward, um, but also really just understanding the type of messaging that you want to create throughout the rest of the year. It's a huge opportunity to set up those tools from heat maps to um, analytical tools and data sets and really understanding what's going on with your business. Um, obviously in the short term, right? If that's a bit different, you don't want to go long term. Really setting all of that stuff up is, is going to be super important. But for us at, at Clickly, a lot of the opportunity that we, that we provide is that audience insight, given that, again, um, what we do is, is advertising across millions of channels and driving those sales. And while audience might be similar, there is an occasional side where we are producing a different audience that the brand is not seeing, which in turn provides a new grapevine, maybe to test out new messaging, et cetera. Um, so overall, again, I think everything that's been said is super important, um, incredibly intelligent. I agree with everything. Uh, but if you can afford to go with a long-term strategy, I, I would I'd certainly look at Black Friday, Cyber Monday as kind of your setup to that. That makes sense to me. Ralph, did you have any final thoughts you'd like to share here on what holiday marketing trends uh, brands should be aware of? Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> I'm going to touch on a little bit of what everyone said. I hope everyone doesn't mind that. But I think uh, <clears throat> for us, it's just the, the areas to play in now, if you think about it on the brand side of things, right? Years gone past, it was Facebook and Google, and that was going to be 70% of your paid budget and 30%. Now you have you know, TikTok, Pinterest, Snapchat, connected TV, all these mediums with all these, you know, developing demographics coming in that are looking for different things. And you have to be able to understand as you're planning your budgets there, you know, where are we going to allocate? What's our plan B going to be if these things don't work out? Um, and how can that be cohesive? One thing in particular that has sort of really shifted in, in, on top of that you know, diversifying between those platforms is now investing more in brand, right? And when I say investing more in brand, it's like, how can we, you know, to uh, Garen's point there, provide evergreen content that's going to help us in this season, as well as seasons gone past, you know, new year, new me, spring, summer, etc. And what that has looked like at Hawked has been, you know, working with affiliates, you know, paid opportunities within the affiliate world, you know, publications, ambassadors, things like that, allowing people like myself, or when I'm looking at Black Friday, Cyber Monday, for me to discover them by not looking for them in particular, right? Having um, certain different uh, areas of information talk about, you know, the benefits and the opportunities within a certain brand and what they're doing on a sustainable standpoint and how good they are at customer service and how I can return it or warranty and all those things and letting essentially the user sell themselves, essentially. And then all of the communication sort of post that first discovery, which would be happening Q3, sort of as we approach Q4, it's a very simple message, right? It doesn't help when all your paid ads are saying, you know, all different type of messages. It's like, no, this person's already showed interest. Now it's your job not to mess them up. Let's just, you know, bring them slowly but surely in. Let's, you know, not push too hard. Let's focus on parts of the brand that really excite them in the first place. So yeah, in a nutshell, I would say it is, it's really, um, you know, 
understanding that the paid world is is more complicated it is more expensive and what are those options that we're going to utilize to ensure that this you know black friday cyber monday is the most successful one yet um so yeah that's where i would leave off actually awesome Thank you for that final thought. I do want to make sure we wrap up in a timely manner. Uh, so thank you all for taking the time today. We did have a question from the audience that I think we could end on. If anyone has a burning pressing question, feel free to drop it in now and we'll hopefully try and get to it either here quickly or by uh, email after, after the fact in our follow-up. But the one question we have here is how does Voipus fit in? Skip the extra delivery fee. Uh, does anyone want to weigh in here, perhaps Darren or Garen? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll take first stab at this. I think Bopus is a fantastic uh, option to offer for some of your customers. Its limitation really comes in uh, around product availability, right? So buy online, pick up in store. Um, a lot of times the reason people opt to buy online is they don't want the inconvenience of having to leave the house. They don't want the inconvenience of having to go to the store in the first place. So that's a great fit for a lot of your audience. Um, if and when the products can be made available. Otherwise, they usually see the same amount of shipping time to get to the store as versus their front door. Adding Bopis may give them a little bit of feel good uh, for picking it up rather than having it delivered to their front door. But with regard to environmental impact, um, it uh, probably isn't too, too much different. I mean, maybe a little since we're aggregating the delivery of packages to a single location. But um, for some folks, if it, if it can represent convenience, fantastic. Uh, for others, it doesn't. But uh, the consumer experience uh, should have as many options as possible to simply suit the needs or preferences as many people as possible. I, that makes I sense. would agree there. Um, and even on the flip side too, like buy online, purchase in store, be able to buy online and return in store as well. Um, at the same time, just per, we want the sale, but thinking about it after anything that we can do to prompt personal support, make it easy and hassle free for returns is probably the most important aspect. I could have an incredible time getting my product and then I get it and it doesn't fit, let's say for a shirt. If it's incredibly annoying for me to try to return it and get another size or get my money back, I'm immediately turned off. All of that work you've done as a brand is just washed out. Um, so again, having all of that opportunity to just make it really easy and hassle-free is the most important. And, and Bopus is a great example of both getting it, feeling it, but also if I need to return it and it's a block away, boom, I can really quick. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense to me. I think convenience is everything, knowing your customer, what their wants and needs are, um, and hopefully delivering on that as much as possible, or in this case, not delivering and letting them pick it up. Um, but yeah, I want to be efficient with everyone's time. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us today. For anyone who doesn't know, we actually have a Black Friday Cyber Monday playbook coming out, which everyone who attended today will receive. It has some amazing offers from our partners here with us today, as well as obviously from Hawk Media. Uh, we wanted to ensure that in case there were any last minute tweaks you needed to make to your marketing tech stack to make this a successful holiday shopping season, that you were armed with the best in class solutions to do so. Um, in addition to that, some of you may not know, we also have a revenue-based funding solution here at Hawk Media called Hawk Capital. So if that's of interest, just reach out to us and let us know. Like I said, we will be sending a follow-up email uh, with all that information and with that Black Friday Cyber Monday playbook for you all to enjoy and take advantage of. And then, of course, some of our wonderful panelists here have shared their contact information with you as well. Um, either they've told you or they've dropped their emails in the chat. So feel free to reach out to them as well. If anyone is interested in partnerships with Hawk Media, you can always reach me at ashley at hawkmedia.com. And similarly for Ralph, if you want to talk more about how we can help your brand soar, it's ralph at hawkmedia.com. Awesome. Well, like I said, I know we're a few minutes over, so I'll let you all get back to your day and have a wonderful Tuesday. Bye, everyone. Cool. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you.